Hi everyone, this is Chem Interview. Here we usually talk with the most outstanding people from chemical science and industry. And our today's guest is one of the leading specialists in Europe and the world in the area of computational chemistry. His name is Stefan Grima. Mr. Grima, thank you very much for being with us. Could you please say a few words about what you do in chemistry? Yeah, my name is Stefan Grimba. So I'm the head of the Malikta Center for Theoretical Chemistry in, in Bonn. Uh, so we are three professors here doing theoretical chemistry in, in, in various areas. So I'm responsible mainly for molecular quantum chemistry. Interested, I mean, our group is interested mainly in big molecules, but, but still molecules. My colleagues do research on solids and liquids. Um, yeah, we are developing methods and uh, doing applications with these methods in basically all areas of chemistry. But my background is, is more, or well, I'm more familiar with organic chemistry applications, but of course, including transition metal chemistry, so catalysis and so on and so forth. Yeah, but mainly uh, I'm a method developer, so this is at my heart. Uh, originally, I'm a physical chemist, so I did spectroscopy in my, during my PhD, but then half of my PhD was already uh, doing calculations for what I measured at that time using some special spectroscopic technique. Yeah, and then I moved basically in my postdoc and then later habilitation entirely to quantum chemistry or theoretical chemistry. And this is what I'm doing since well, 30 years or so. And how did you decide to do the computational chemistry and not physical organic chemistry in the wet lab, for example? So I was f fascin fascinated in the, in the, so my PhD was in the early 90s, so end of the 80s, early 90s. So computers came up and uh, I, I recognized the potential of, of doing chemistry on the computer. That, uh, and I, I, I love to program. So programming was really, so I'm totally keen, keen on that at that time. Uh, so solving chemical problems with a computer that, yeah. And then I basically switched during my PhD to, 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 compute, to doing computation. So this is, um, you are much. You have much more freedom to choose your subject, your topic, your favorite system when you have the computer. So, kind of virtual spectrometer. Then, if you're doing it in reality, in reality, it's also always so difficult. It's dirty and dangerous and costly and so on. And in the computer, it's relatively easy to to follow new ideas. So, so I'm a, I'm a relatively quick person yeah I, I changed my my mind within short time and and this is this is very difficult in in reality but it's it's pretty easy virtually this is the main the main advantage of doing virtual chemistry or computational chemistry we know that quantum chemistry arose like in the 30s or 40s of the 20th century and since that time almost 80 years have passed. What are the main advances and what are the main discoveries that quantum chemistry and also the computational chemistry have achieved during these 80 years? So rather many, in, in the early days, it was mainly spectroscopy. So the energy levels of whatever molecule, there, there, there are very many examples, dissociation energies, uh, atmospheric chemistry, so mechanisms there, so yeah, spectroscopy mainly. But then <clears throat> these techniques in the, say, until the 70s, 80s or so, the theory was not really applicable to bigger systems. So it was all gas phase, small systems. Very successful, but not really the broad impact in chemistry. And then in the 90s or end of the 80s, density functional theory came up. And this was kind of the, the game changer for 
and in my in my opinion, really the birth of computational chemistry, because with with reasonable computational resources, you can you can investigate basically any chemistry, including transition metal chemistry, right? Which is which was not possible before. So density function theory and the investigation of catalytic reaction mechanisms involving metals that was only possible with DFT. So I would say this really, this, this breaks through some kind of exponential growth in, also in the literature that started in, in the beginning of the 90s. So when I, when I did my, my postdoc and when I first came in contact with DFT, so it was 94 or so. Yeah, that was, that was really a game changer. And since then, I mean, you can look up the literature you will find nowadays in, in very many papers, really significant contributions of, 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 of theory. That was totally different in 30 years ago. So we, at that time it was rare or, uh, or spectroscopy, right? so mainly. And probably the density functional theory is the most important theory or potential method for applied theoretical chemistry for the transition states, geometries, and so on. I mean, I mean, one should not forget that before DFT, we had semi-empirical theories. So they, they are known since 60s, 70s or so, but, but they were simply too bad. I mean, they were, were not really accepted by most, of, most chemists because they were inaccurate. Not always, but often. Right? They, they were not really as robust as DFT. And this, this changed the way of thinking. You have mentioned now the accuracy of the calculations. And the two days computational methods, there are plenty of them, they produce the results of chemical accuracy one kilojoule per mole. So do you think that in the next years, in the next decades, computational chemists would also try to make the methods more accurate? or the sufficient accuracy has been achieved, and then we will try to make our methods rather fast. Yeah, this is a good but difficult question to answer because this accuracy, this depends so much, this discussion, what problem, how big is the system? What is the question? Is it in solution? What is the temperature? And so on and so forth. What is typically mentioned is one kcal or, yeah, or kilojoule for, for spectroscopic accuracy. This is sufficient for most chemical problems. So if we could compute the free energy basically of any system, of interest in chemistry to one kcal, then we could solve probably 99.9% .9 of all problems. But the, the question is, for, for, for how many systems does this really hold? So definitely currently not for protein, for example, right? So, or for a big catalyst in solution or if you include entropy. So if you have the free energy instead of energy. So this, this question is difficult to answer. In any case, in my opinion, so the one kcal is in a way sufficient, but we have to make it faster and more robust. So for many more systems. So it, it, it definitely has to be one kcal, not, not only sometimes, basically for having one kcal for anything, that, that is the, the kind of dream. Uh, much more accurate in chemistry, except if you're looking for spectroscopy, I don't think this is necessary. And you have mentioned that nowadays the problem is that Although we can calculate the properties of small molecules, like organic molecules, it is also important to reproduce such accuracy for large systems, like proteins. And as far as I know, there are two main ideas how to do it. The first one is using the artificial intelligence, and we will talk about it later. And the second one is probably more rare, the linear scaling method. So, 
what do you think? Are, are we going to implement these methods for applied science, for applied structural biology or stuff like that? Yeah, regarding, regarding these linear scaling methods, uh, the answer is pretty easy because these methods are based on a well-defined theory. It's normally wave function theory, so couple cluster, even DFT. So, so you have a well-defined theory and you try to make good numerical approximations to, to cut the, the scaling behavior down. This is very reasonable and, and, and I think it works up to some point. Um, when you still have this prefactor, I mean, if you have a linear scaling method, that is fine. But you still have, it, it takes, it takes, right? It's, it's only linear scaling, but the prefactor is normally big. So this will prevent you from, from doing MD for a protein with, with couple cluster for in the foreseeable future, I would say, right? So in principle, that, that this is straightforward and yeah, people do it and should do it. But this is not, not, not a solution to all the problems because the, the, at some point, the prefactor still is a constant of the, of the complexity of the problem, okay? So you cannot make it smaller except for sacrificing totally the numerical accuracy that you need. I mean, if you have a big system, then the total energy is big and then you cannot, cannot accept big errors anymore because then you cannot geometry optimize or you can't do MD anymore if the forces are bad, for example. So, so this is straightforward, but not the solution. Yeah, the other, the other project you mentioned uh, is, is artificial intelligence or machine learning, which is totally um, modern and everybody's doing it nowadays. I mean, this is, I'm skeptical. I mean, this is, it's definitely interesting, worthwhile to investigate this. This is something for the younger generation, definitely. They should do it and they do it. Uh, but the problem there, that is there is no underlying theory. You, you have this learning training problem and your, your approach will only work for the systems for which, which has been trained for, right? So, what we are really want to have in chemistry are predictions to, to unknown systems, the, the unknown territory. And this is absolutely impossible with the machine learning method. It can only interpolate in, in, in the area, area where it was trained. So this missing extrapolation capability, this is in my opinion, really a very, very weak, weak point that you basically can't overcome because there is no theory. So for my, my opinion on this is that for some problems or classes of problems, this is good to have and probably the best solution to go for such extremely empirical uh, approaches. But yeah, this is, this is a special purpose thing in a way. This is also the reason why we are doing it, but not, this is not our main focus. And what are maybe the five things which computational chemistry may allow us to do in the future? So you, <clears throat> the first thing is that you can design properties, basically. Uh, you're, you're looking for a substance that has this or that property, small or large homolumo gap, big binding affinity, or is extremely flexible or extremely rigid then this can be tested before synthesis, before you even think about a synthesis in the computer. And so these relatively simple properties so or standard properties are so easy to compute and so, so accurate that this is, that should be done. And, and you can do this in a massively screening way. So you screen thousands to millions of compounds that are automatically generated and that lead your, lead your intuition or your chemical thinking maybe in, in new areas, just by looking at the properties of millions of compounds that have been computed. So it helps us with our way of rethinking chemistry or yeah, intuition, yeah. expands our intuition in a way. So yeah, the really rational design, I mean, design is, 
is always a kind of bit rational, but this is really rational, right? You, you have a target property, you want to do something, some function you want to implement, implement with your molecule or your, or your solid or whatever. And then you really take computational chemistry beforehand as a, as a tool, as a standard tool, as a routine tool. I mean, in every lab, it will be implemented at, in the 20, 30 years in, in, in the computers. That I will have. This is my view of the future there. A question which bothers really uh, many people. Shall the person who wants to do computational chemistry be really brilliant in mathematics? Or it's like supplementary knowledge, but not the crucial one? I mean, computational chemistry, if you see it as an application, more application science, then there is no, not so much need for, for, for experience or knowledge of maths. Because then chemical intuition and chemical thinking is more important. Of course, if you want to do a uh, method development, then math is of course a must because the equations have to be solved in a way efficiently. And this is a lot of programming. More, it's more programming than math, but the math is not complicated, right? So what we are basically trying is always making linear algebra out of our equations. And linear algebra, come on, is not so difficult. You have also touched upon my next question about programming. Since it's a very broad area with many different languages, databases and so on, maybe you could name some good teams and probably also the languages that are important for those who would like to go to computational chemistry. In applied computational chemistry, but also for those who would like to do the method development. Yeah, the first... <clears throat> thing is both in development and in the application, the clear thinking. You have to define and formulate and analyze the problem. Both if you're, if you're analyzing a reaction mechanism in an application, or if you're analyzing the equations to implement and then to implement them. The clear thinking about the problem, this is the key. If this is, if you're good in, in, in this, analysis and this analytic thinking, then this is a, the topic for you. In the, as I said, in the application part, it's definitely some chemical knowledge and chemical intuition is needed right? because you're basically handling the molecules in the computer. It's a bit diff different than in, in, the, in the lab and in the flask, but you have to see them and you have to feel them, this bond and this polarity and so on and so forth. With the programming, I, so, so the, the languages come and go. I mean, I started actually with basic, then I did Pascal and then Fortran since, since the eighties or so, still Fortran. Nowadays, it's Python or C++ or whatever. I mean, they are all in a way similar. And this is a kind of, they come and go. Uh, Fortran and C, so Fortran is probably the language that is most solid and the oldest one, and it will, it will never go. Because there's actually so many codes, big codes in the world still running Fortran. And Fortran is one of the very fast languages. So at the end of the day, you want to have a fast code. Huh? And Fortran is known to be to produce extremely fast codes. So therefore, Fortran will definitely survive. It's also good to have some C or C++ knowledge, definitely, because other languages are similar to C or C++. But what language to take, this is, this is they, they all use the the very basic same constructs and arrays, vectors, and so on, ways to declare and to assign variables. And so this, this, this the difference is really minor, minor, I would say. Not so important. And hereby a question regarding operating systems. Most of us have uh, on their computers, personal computers, either Mac or Windows. But as far as I know, in different labs and computations, people use Linux. 
Could you please say if Linux is really so important? Cannot say much about Windows because I never used it. I really, never in my, ever in my life. So I, I lived since 30, 40 years with Linux. Uh, so a life without Windows is possible, definitely. Uh, so for quantum chemistry codes, there are absolutely more so more options using uh, using in the Linux world. So there are a few codes on Windows, but definitely all of them are on Linux. So the, the really the good ones, the professional ones. Some have been ported to to Windows, but not all of them. And by the way, come on, so using using some Linux uh, console for for some simple calculations. This is this is done by all of our students regularly every every semester. So they learn it in in, in a few hours. Come on. So this, I see no I see no reason not to try it. And maybe you could tell us a few words about how your workflow is organized. Is it different from uh, those who are working in in the web lab, for example? It's probably not so different from the workflow of my experimental colleagues who are W3 professors, because you may imagine that it is tons of emails every day, right? So, and everybody's answering uh, tons of emails. So this is regarding very many different issues. So it's, it's a lot of handling of scientific papers, so publishing. Then it's a lot of discussion with, of course, with my students. Uh, yeah, last two years more by mail and Zoom than, than in reality. But I personally try to also do a lot of research by myself. So I'm really have projects where I'm really the leading person. So I'm supported by my students, my PhD students and my, my Akademischer Rat, but, but basically I'm the head of the thing. Uh, so I'm leading the project and doing also most of the work. And so this is what I'm doing since, since very many years that I'm really trying to do really my own research. And this is different from, from, from experimental colleagues because they can't go to the lab anymore. But I can, so I try to work at least half of the day doing method development on my laptop. So, so really programming and method development, yeah. If I asked someone in computational chemistry community, especially in applied computational chemistry community about you, then probably the most straightforward answer will be that it is the person who invented this D3 correction. It is standard nowadays and very broadly used. Could you please explain in a few words what is the dispersion and why is it so important to include this correction into the calculations to take it into account? Why is it important? So all matter attracts at long distance. So if, if atoms or more general electrons, so a matter is composed of electrons and nuclei, if they are far apart and have very, very little interaction, there is still an interaction. So a very, very long ranged force. We call this the, the dispersion force and it was well, it's often also called, or you may have heard it under the name London force or van der Waals force. And this is always, absolutely always, for sure, attractive. So it attracts molecules, atoms, aggregates, so that, that condensed matter exists at normal temperatures, so liquids and solids, and that, that molecules come together so that they can react, is mainly an effect, we call this, a non-covalent interaction and a large part of this non-covalent interaction is, is this dispersion force or this dispersion interaction. So it's always appearing when 
two electrons come closer but are relatively far apart. And this important force, which you can't switch off, this is uh, missing in some of the, of the mainstream theories that have been used for decades. So this is namely Hartree-Fock method and density function theory, which is the most widely used electronic structure theory. That, that part of the interaction between electrons was missing or at least under, underrated. Yeah, and then you can add a correction for this. And this works pretty well. Yeah, and is basically nowadays a standard. But 20 years ago, nobody was, was using actually. And, and 20 years ago, all DFT calculations basically were flawed by, by this missing attraction. So all the interactions, all the potentials, all the geometries, all the thermochemistry were not tightly enough bound in a way. Uh, it's, it's a weak effect if, if the system is small, but it's basically adding up. It's summing over all the pairs of, of interactions. Maybe I give, can give an example so for, the, so for the dispersion. I mean, that water is liquid, okay, at room temperature. This is extremely important for us, for life, okay? Without dispersion, water would be a gas, more or less, at, at uh, room temperature. Or it will boil at, I don't know, 30 degrees or so. So life without, so only for water, life would, wouldn't be possible without the dispersion interaction between the water molecules. Can computational chemistry be used in industry for pharmaceutical industry processes, for example, for product development and so on? Or it is very academic discipline, which is restricted basically to universities and research centers. This answer is very clear. It's, it's definitely used in industry more and more. So all the big comp companies have computational chemistry group, groups. BASF, for example, has a big group with 20 to 30 people or so. Two of my PhD students recently were hired by BASF. So definitely the industry knows or now sees the potential of applying um, computational chemistry or in a way replacing costly and inefficient procedures, experimental procedures by computational ones, which, which are cheaper, cleaner, yeah. cheap, yeah, mainly cheaper. So this is, the, the answer is definitely yes, this will inc further increase. And which recommendations you could give to those who are studying in the first, second semester and their quantum chemistry courses haven't started yet, but they want to develop themselves and start studying this complicated field. Probably some recommendations about the literature or some good reviews. So there's a, <clears throat> a fantastic textbook, Computational Chemistry by Frank Jensen. So this is definitely the recommended book. Uh, it's understandable from the first to the last page, even for non-experts. And the, the more difficult parts can just be skipped. So it's a fantastic book. It's a good starting point. And then I would suggest just to try with a free program, right? So, for example, Orca is a program, Orca by Frank uh, Mese, which, which is free and has fantastic capabilities in all very various areas of chemistry. It's easy to use, intuitive. Uh, yeah, basically, for, yeah, you can start right away. Some students may think that computational chemistry deals much with computers and so on, and that sometimes it might be a bit boring. Is it true? Yeah, if you don't like computers, then this is, this is of course not your subject. You, 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 uh, you, I wouldn't say that you have to love your computer, but I mean, it's your, your workhorse in a way. The, the cowboy has to like the horse. I have a bit more philosophical question. When we are doing the calculations, it means that we are trying to predict something. Wait, wait. If often something is not, not so many properties are really predicted. Often you, you recompute something that you already know. 
So true prediction, true pred predictions are rare. Okay, then my question will be ever more interesting. So do you think that the world that surrounds us is fully describable and calculable? So can we describe the world around us using only physics and mathematics and predict anything we want, considering we have enormous computer power? So if you consider a small aspect of reality, and if this, this kind of cutout is small, then the answer is yes. But if you thinking about say simulating the brain or something like this so that is a, attempts uh, have been yeah, are made to do this then the question is difficult to answer i mean saying yes in general this is useless the question is can in pre are we on a way to do it? So, and people are trying to simulate a cell already, a total cell with all the components, with all the atoms. But this is only at the class at the classical level. So, and at this purely classical level, you miss very, very important quantum effects. So, and simulating the whole cell with all the electrons and so quantum mechanically is absolutely impossible for the yeah, for very very many years if not yeah, I, I don't know so then the, the, the question principle the, the answer is always yes because we have a theory now the, you can, can also ask the question is the theory complete of, of matter then it, the, the true answer is yeah, only up to some point because the true theory is relativistic and we don't have a fully relativistic theory or a fully relativistic combination of quantum mechanics and relativity. So there's still a very, very tiny, tiny piece of theory that is missing at the end of the day. If you're, if you're looking in very, very much detail, so I would say even the question, yes, in principle, is not totally clear. But if the system is not so too big and the question is clear and it's a kind of separable thing, in principle, with the theory we have, we can compute more or less everything. Yeah. Yeah. But so uh, the answer is, is difficult. The question is extremely difficult. About the career path of computational chemists, as far as I know, there are many cases when people finishing their PhDs in computational chemistry end up in classical programming as IT specialists. Why do you think is it so? In my, my opinion, the, the reason is there are not so many really dedicated positions right now for computational chemists, but this will increase definitely. The other answer is that chemists and maybe computational chemists in particular are well educated and broadly applicable in very in various fields okay they are very analytic normally they have this cl very clear thinking they often can program or have at least uh, experience with computers so this is all properties that are can be uh, applied in um, in the in various areas. But what is changing in the labor market right now that you suppose that the total number of market positions for uh, computational chemists will be increasing? Because this artificial intelligence technology will, will be used in, also in chemistry, will, this application, will, these applications will increase. Maybe this is right now starting. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Grimmer for this beautiful talk.